you have your Bibles, turn to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. And uh, I thought my next message that I was going to teach concerning righteousness was going to be, you know, our righteousness connected to authority. And when I heard from uh, Miss Carolyn yesterday and, and asked me if I'd minister today, I'd, I was just like, okay, Lord, is there, but I knew I wasn't quite ready. I was, there's still things I'm praying about. So I knew that wasn't the direction I needed to go this morning. And so then I thought, well, there's some other things. I ministered to the men on, on Thursday night. I, you know, that I, you know, I was like just praying about it, but sat down and just, just got quiet. And, and the Lord just took me to Romans chapter six. And, and we're going to get there in a moment, but, but just understanding this aspect of righteousness, Say this with me, righteousness, righteousness. It's, who I am. it's who I am, not what I'm trying to be. You know, you've you got to get a hold of this aspect of how God sees you, how God sees you, not how you see yourself, not how you look at your past, not how other people see you, but how God sees you. In Romans chapter 1, it talks about, it's a real familiar scripture, you know, it talks about the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. To the Jew first and also the Greek. And then and a lot of times we stop reading there. We say, yeah, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. And, and, we sh- and it is. The, the gospel, within the gospel, within the good news, within the gospel, what Jesus did on the cross is good news. And there's power within the gospel. So I'm not making light of the fact that there's power in the gospel. But the power in the gospel is meant to produce something in a believer's life. Because it says the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to the Jew first and also the Greek. For therein lies righteousness. For therein, I'm sorry, righteousness is revealed. So the gospel, the power of it, is to lead us to a place called righteousness. Come on. Not really a place, but to our identity of being righteous. See, righteousness is revealed in the gospel. So if we really pay attention to the gospel, the good news is to make things right in my life. You know, Jesus said, the spirit of God is upon me. He's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to heal the blind, to, to, to raise the dead, to, you know, to, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. So what is that? The gospel for him to preach the gospel was to take wrong things and make them right, right? So, so we have to understand the gospel is about the power of God into salvation. Yes. Yes. Second Corinthians chapter five says, says if you, it talks about if you're in Christ, it says old things, say old things. Old things, old things have passed away and behold, all things have become new. But too often we like to stay in the old things. Too often we like to meditate about the old things and we wonder why we never step into the peace that new things can bring because why we like the old things we're familiar with the new things why because we may not really fully see the new things and then it goes in and it talks about how he who knew no sin knew no sin no sin he who knew no sin was made sin so that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. He was made sin so we could be made righteous. And that's not when we get to heaven. That's the moment that you made Jesus the Lord of your life. You see, the moment you made Jesus the Lord of your life, your spirit man is as righteous as he'll ever be. And I put it this way, this way last week. Where it says that he became something that he wasn't. So I could become something that I wasn't. Let me say it again. He became something he wasn't so I could be something that I could never be. And that's righteous. You are righteous. Say that with me. I am am righteous. righteous. Let's look here in Romans chapter 6. It says, what shall we say to all this? I'm going to read. Let me find it in my other Bible here too because I want to bring this out the way it reads it. Thank you, Father. Man. For your presence, Lord. 
In the Amplified, it says, What shall we say to all this? Are we to remain in sin in order that God's grace may multiply and over, overflow? Do I need to explain that? Should I remain in sin? I mean, should I continue living this old life so I can say God's grace is abounding? Certainly not. How can we who died to sin live in it any longer? Are you ignorant of the fact that all of us who have been baptized into Christ were baptized into, a de into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by the baptism into the death so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, so we too might habitually live and behave in the newness of life. Now, now get that. Meaning, if I've been baptized with Christ, if I've put on Christ, shouldn't my actions have changed? Shouldn't I be behaving in this newness of life? There should have been some sort of change that's happened. Now, now don't get in condemnation here, okay? Because, because we talked about last week, there's no more consciousness of sin. But what I want to deal with this morning, what I believe the Holy Spirit wants us to cover this morning is realize is, is most of the time we stay in the old because we don't fully understand and receive the new. Because we like to meditate and identify more with our old selves than we do what God's truly made us to be. And the more you meditate about the old, like I said, you'll never step into the new. The more you meditate about sin, the more you meditate about, about different things, the, you'll never be able to step into what you're created and called to be. Let's, let me read this in, in the message. And this is a number of scriptures, but, but I, I'm just doing this by the, by the Holy Spirit because, because I believe that you're going to receive something here and see some things maybe you haven't seen before about who you are and how to walk in this righteousness. Verse 1 in the message in Romans 6. So what do we do? Keep on sinning so God can keep on forgiving? I should hope not. If we've left the country where sin is sovereign, how can we still live in our old house there? Or didn't you realize we packed up and left there for good? That is what happened in baptism when we went under the water. We left the old country of sin behind when we came up out of the water. We entered into a new country of grace, a new life in a new land. That's what baptism into the new life of Jesus means. When we are lowered into the water, it's like the burial of Jesus. When we are raised up out of the water, it's like the resurrection of Jesus. Each, is a, each of us raised into the light-filled world by our Father so that we can see where we're going in our new grace sovereign country. Could it be any clearer? Our old way of life was nailed to the cross with Christ. Have you fully seen your old life nailed to the cross? Or do you like to reminisce about the old life? Because you, you can't, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So, so if your life seems to be unstable at times, and, you, and you're, you're up one day and you're down the next, and, and you, you don't really know what tr true joy is, you don't know what true happiness is, then that lets me know you truly don't know what's been nailed to the cross. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. A decisive end to this sin-miserable life. No longer at sin's beck and call. What we believe is this. If we get included into Christ's sin-conquering death, we also get included into his life-saving resurrection. We know that when Jesus was raised from the dead, it was a signal of the end of death as the end. Never again will death have the last word. When Jesus died, he took sin down with him. But alive, he brings God down to us. Whew. Man, from now on, think of it this way. Sin speaks a dead language that means nothing. From now on, think of it this way. Sin speaks a dead language that means nothing to you. God speaks your mother tongue and you hang on to every word. You're dead to sin and alive to God. That's what Jesus did. That means we must not give sin a vote in, in the way you conduct your lives. Don't give it a time of the day. Don't even run a little errand that are connected with the old way of life. Throw yourself wholeheartedly and full time. Remember, you've been raised from the dead into God's way of doing things. Sin can't tell you how to live. After all, you're not living under the old tyranny any longer. You're living in the freedom of God. 
So since we're out from under the old tyranny, does that mean we can live any old way we want since we're free in the freedom of grace? Meaning, since I have grace, can I just live any way I want and be okay? No. That's not what grace is for. Can we do anything that comes to mind? Hardly. You know well enough from your own experience that there are some acts of so-called freedom that destroy freedom. Offer yourself to sin, for instance, and it's the last free act. See, a lot of times people live a life and they think they're free because I can do whatever I want to do. This, this nation is found on, well, I want to be free. I have freedoms in this nation, but you know what? The thing is, is some of your freedoms can put you in bondage. And that's what, a lot of people say, well, I have grace, so I can live any way I want. No, what, what God wants you to say is, he doesn't want you to live bound anymore. Yeah. It's, it, it's not, you know, the Ten Commandments weren't, weren't put, put there for us to be in bondage to something. They were parameters for us to live a life of fullness. Yes. And people say, well, oh, well, all the Old Testament, or the laws passed away. Well, no, it was done away with because now the law's written on our hearts, according to Hebrews. Yeah, that's right. The law just changed places. I'm just, I just don't have to earn it anymore. I don't have to earn my salvation anymore. Jesus did. Yes. So you offer yourself to sin, for instance, and it's your last free act, but offer yourself to the ways of God and the freedom never quits. All your lives, you let sin tell you what to do, but thank God you started listening to a new master. One whose commands set you free to live openly in his freedom. I'm using this freedom language because it's easy to picture. You can really readily recall it, can't you? How at one time, the more you did just what you liked doing, not caring about others, not caring about God, the worse your life became in the less freedom you had. Think about it. Th think about your old life. How, we, you know, you were just, well, if I just get old enough to drink, if I just get old enough to do the, if I just get old enough to do these things, you're like, man, my life will be set. But did it ever really make you happy? Mm -mm. Maybe for a moment, maybe for a season. Maybe for a few hours, but uh, eventually, what, that's what he's saying here. You're not caring about others. You're not caring about God. The worst life became the less freedom you had. And how much difference is it now that you live in God's freedom? Your lives healed and expansive in holiness. As long as you did what you felt like doing, ignoring God, you didn't have to bother with right thinking or right living or right anything for that matter. But do you call that free life? What did you get out of it? Nothing. Nothing you're proud of now. Where to get you? A dead end. But now that you found, but now that you found, you don't have to listen to sin tell you what to do and have discovered the delight of listening to God telling you, what a surprise. A whole, healed, put together life right now with more and more of life on the way. Work hard for sin your whole life and your pension is death. But God's gift is real life eternal life delivered by Jesus and our master. I read all that because I wanted you to get a hold of the fact that Jesus did not come to set us free for us to stay the same. A revelation of righteousness, a revelation of grace should bring about a revolution in our life the way we act, and the way we live. Amen. See, grace, see, a re, what, what does a, re, a revelation of grace do? A revelation of grace is what brings about righteousness. Romans chapter five tells us that. See, a lot of people preach on grace, but they don't teach on what is grace all about. Grace was to bring you to a place of righteousness. But too often people stay in a place of grace, but never step into what they should be. Yeah. So grace should give us a revelation that now we're righteous and a revelation of righteousness should bring about a revolution of how we live, how we treat our spouses, how we treat other people, how we treat the world, how we love the world, how we reach the world. It should change everything about us. Righteousness wasn't for you to become self-righteous. Because you can never be righteous in yourself. You can never be righteous in your ability. You can't do enough to be righteous. You'll never do enough to be righteous. Because Jesus did everything that was required for you to be righteous. Let me just remind you what the definition of righteous, righteous is. 
The, the word righteousness in the Greek means just as I ought to be. So when you say, I am righteous, what are you saying? You're not just saying some religious word. Now you're saying, I'm just what I ought to be. So Jesus came to make me just what I ought to be. Just what we ought to be. Back to Romans 6 here. Thank you, Father. Verse 11. I'm going to read the Amplified. It says, even so, consider yourself also dead to sin and your relationship to it broken, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin therefore rule as a king in your mortal, short-lived, perishable bodies to make you yield to its cravings and be subject to its lust and evil passions. So this righteousness has been provided for me so I could yield to something new. Let me say that again. Righteousness has been provided for me so I could yield to something new. He says, don't consider, don't be fixed on sin anymore. Don't be fixed on the old man. You know, I talked about this last week, the fact that the more and more you meditate on sin and you think about sinning, the more and more you're going to sin. Why? Because you're not renewing your mind to who you really are. No, I've I said that already, but I really just, people need to get a hold of this. Because when you don't know you're righteous, you'll always live in fear and condemnation and a continual cycle of defeat in your life. And realize that old things are past. I don't have to go back there. And there's new things. I might not have discovered them yet. I might not have sensed them yet. I might not know them yet. But there's new things. There's new things that God has. There's new things. There's new things to discover. There's new gifts that I have. There's new talents that I have. But in order for us to step into those things, we have to yield. Yes. See, your life is a sum total of what you've yielded to. You are where you are today because of what you yielded to. Some people are here this morning and some people are not because some yielded to the alarm clock and some didn't. <laughs> you know, some are like, well, I'm, I'm gonna, I'll be at church tomorrow, but you stay up till 4 a.m. and... Oh, sorry, Pastor, I got busy Saturday night, you know. <laughs> Yield, it's, it's what you give way to. Yield is, is, is what you allow to influence your life. You either yield to something, it's either, it's either what I'm allowing to happen to me or what, uh, what I'm giving myself to. See, you, you're, you've, you're where you are because of what you've allowed God to do in your life up to this time. God's not holding anything back from you. Amen. God's not the one that's in cause of your trouble. He's not the one in charge of, 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 of your obstacles that you're going through. He's not the one. It's the enemy. It's, it's our flesh. It's our mind. It's our will. It's our emotion. It's the old man, the old way of doing things that is causing us struggle in our lives. So we need to yield to the new man. Yield to the righteousness of who we truly are. You are righteous. You are righteous. Let's look at verse... 13. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God. Yield yourselves to God. See, you're either going to yield your body to the cravings, the things you want in the natural, or you're going to yield it to God. It's a choice we have. It's a choice that we have. Amen. Thank you, Father. Matthew chapter 5, it says, they that hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be filled. They that hunger and thirst after righteousness. You can say God's way of doing. Those that yield themselves to God's way of doing things will be filled. Another translation is satisfied. 
Hunger and thirst. What does that represent? Hunger and third, thirst represents you have a need in your life. There's something that you're lacking. There's something that you're coming short of. Also, the word hunger and thirst is also the same words that you would get as someone being desperate. Someone desperate. If I don't get food now, I'm not going to make it. So here, the person that's in need, the person that's in need, those that are hungering thirst after yielding to God's way of doing things, their life will be filled. So it's what I yield to that determines whether my life is going to be satisfied or not, right? Go to Zephaniah chapter 2. I know you read there a lot. <laughs> because this scripture connects well with the Matthew chapter 5. It's a prophetic scripture. It's right before Haggai, right after Habakkuk. You know, it's like... HZ, HZ, that's how I can, my mind, uh, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, that's how I, just so you know. if you're like HZ, HZ, what's that? It's, it's, it's pastor code, you know, it's, yeah. <laughs> Zephaniah 2 verse 3, in the Amplified it says, seek the Lord, inquire for him, inquire of him, and require him as the foremost necessity of your life. Now think about that. Seek the Lord, inquire of him, and require him as the foremost necessity of your life. That's, all, that's yielding. Whatever you're seeking is what you're yielding to. All of you humble of the land who have acted in compliance with God's revealed will and have kept his commandments, seek righteousness, seek humility, inquire for them, require them as vital. It may be you will be hidden in the day of the Lord's anger. And what does this mean here? He's saying, seek the Lord as a vital necessity. Then he talks about all the, hum excuse me, of the humble of the land. Then it defi defines for us who are the humble. Some people have the idea that humble is, well, just woe is me. I'm unworthy. You know, I, I'm, I'm no good. I'm, I'm nothing. No, he tells us who the humble are. The humble are those that act in compliance with God's revealed will. So how can you tell that you're truly humble is when you're, when you're walking according to his word. It says, seek righteousness, seek humility. You know, whatever you're yielding to is what you've humbled, submitted, and surrender yourself to. You, you, you bearing with me? I'm kind of going kind of quick, but... But think about this. If I'm yielding, yield myself to God, that means I'm, I'm seeking him. That means I'm pursuing him as a vital necessity. I'm going after him. Then it says, seek righteousness, pursue righteousness, pursue humility. Now let's go back to Romans chapter, let's go to Romans 7. I, I need to just lay, lay a foundation here for where we're going because, because I don't want to put you back under the works to become righteous. All right? Walking our righteousness is going to be, come down to who we surrender ourselves to, who we submit ourselves to. Now look, look at Romans chapter 7. Verse 15. And this is one of the most confusing scriptures in the Bible. <laughs> for that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that I do. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that is good. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that in my flesh dwells no good thing, for to, to will is present with me, but how to perform what, what that is good, I find not. Whoa, that's confusing. So pretty much is saying, you know, I don't want to do this thing, but I'm doing this thing. And the very thing I'm doing, I don't want to do, but I want to do this thing, but I really can't because there's this other thing that I'm doing. <laughs> you kind of, it's an old man has passed away, old things become new. So too often as believers, we live in the middle. We live in the middle. We live with, you know, I call it a mug womp. Your mug's on one side and your, and your womp's on the other. And so, 
you know, it's like I'm, I'm living these two lives because I don't really know my identity because I still like to be so familiar with my old identity that I can never truly let go and yield myself to his identity. And so Paul is in this thing that, how do I do this? Amplified uh, says this, it says, for I do not understand my own actions. I'm baffled, bewildered. I do not practice or accomplish what I wish, but I do the very thing that I loathe, meaning I'm doing the things I hate doing. Man, I hated that. Verse 16, now if I do habitually what is contrary to my desire, that means I acknowledge and agree that the law is good, morally excellent, and that I take sides with it. However, it is no longer I who do the deed, but the sin principle, which is at home in me, has possession of me. For I know that nothing good dwells within me. That is, in my flesh, I can will what is right, but I cannot perform it. I have the intention, now listen, and urge to do what is right, but no power to carry it out. Now, I was praying about this yesterday and, and thinking about this and, and just really thinking and meditating on this. And, 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 I, and I got this idea. It says, because we keep doing the things we don't want to do. But Paul's saying, I know it's wrong, but I don't have the power in myself to carry it out. Now, let's look at verse 25. Actually, verse 24. Oh, unhappy and pitiable and wretched man that I am. You know, one of the most thing, miserable things is, is for a Christian to stay in living in a sinful lifestyle. That's miserable because most of the time, they, you don't really want to be there. You don't like the results that you're getting. You don't like your life. And so therefore, you go deeper into it trying to cover up everything else. So he says, oh, unhappy and pitiable, wretched man that I am, who will release and deliver me from the shackles of this body of death? And he says, oh, thank God, he will through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now, now why am I bringing this out? Because, because here we've been, we, we're, we need to yield to God and not yield to the flesh, right? Yeah. And Paul's saying, I don't have the power to carry it out. But then he says, oh, wretched man that I am, who's going to deliver me from the body of this death? And he says, oh, Jesus, he will. See, everything comes back to Jesus. Everything comes back to Jesus. And Paul isn't talking about when he gets to heaven. He's talking about how do I live in my righteousness? How do I live in this free gift of righteousness? Through one man's offenses, death came. But through one man's obedience, righteousness came to all men. You know, so, so Paul is talking to us about this righteousness. And he says, how do I live in this righteousness? Because in the natural, I don't have the power to carry it out. Let's go to John chapter 1. Thank you, Father. John chapter 1. Thank you, Father. Verse 16, talking of Jesus, says, And of his fullness have we all received... And grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Paul said, I don't have the power to carry it out. But he said, through Jesus. But through Jesus. So then he tells us here, and his, of his fullness have we all received grace for grace. The word grace, better translated is an empowerment. It's God's ability to help you do what you can't do in your own ability. So out of his fullness, we have all received ability. His ability. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Grace and truth. So when Paul was talking about, I don't have the power to overcome it. I don't have the power in my ability. But he's saying, through Jesus I do. He's really saying, through grace and truth I do. Through grace and truth, I have the ability to overcome. But the key in what I want to deal with this morning is a word that comes down to this, humility. In order for us to truly walk in righteousness, we need to truly understand humility. Humility, I believe, 
one of the greatest definitions is this, total surrender. You see, until you totally surrender, see, when you totally surrender, that's when grace is available. You are a recipient of grace when you surrender, when you yield. Remember Paul said, yield, don't no longer yield your instruments to sin, but yield your instruments to righteousness to God. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Romans 6 again, verse 14 says, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you're not under the law, but under grace. Sin shall not have dominion over you. Now get a hold of that. Sin shall not, will not have dominion over you, for you're not under the law, but you're under grace. What did John say? Out of his fullness, we have all received fullness. Then he tells us the law came by Moses, but what grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. So what we need to see this morning, what I want us to see this morning is the fact that we need this grace. We have to have this grace because the grace is the power to walk out your righteousness. Grace is the enablement to lead you to righteousness and grace is the empowerment for you to walk out your righteousness. Grace isn't something that com comes on you so you can live unrighteously. Grace comes on your life so you can live like Jesus. Don't get that mixed up. God's empowered you so you could live above the world's way of living. But see, we have to get out of our head up here trying to live out of here. No, this is a heart thing. This is a heart thing where we totally say, you know what? My all is on the altar. And I surrender everything to you, God. I yield my life to you. I yield my hands to you. I yield my gifts to you. I yield my talents to you. And you know what? The moment that you do that, grace kicks in. And you're able to do things that you never thought you would do or you wanted to do. But grace is available. There's things I, that I, I did as a, as a Christian and things I've done in serving God that I never thought I did. I, I didn't, even though I knew I was called to something, there's things that I've done that weren't a thought in my mind before I accepted Christ. Grace. We need this grace in our lives. You can't live, you can't live above your flesh apart from grace. You can't think it away. You can't wish it away. You have to live out of the reborn spirit that's on the inside of you. Amen. We live too much out of our head instead of out of the reborn spirit of what we were made to be. Thank you, Father. We need this grace, this grace in our lives. Why is grace so important? Let's go to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28. Let us therefore receive a kingdom that is firm and stable and cannot be shaken. Offer to God pleasing service and acceptable worship with modest and pious care and godly fear and all. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Wherefore, we receive a kingdom which cannot be moved. King James says, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably. Now, it's interesting, this word let here in the Greek is actually a phrase that means let us hold fast to. So in here, in the King James says, wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved. You know, when you made Jesus the Lord of your life, you are now became a part of a kingdom that nothing else can shake it. You've received a kingdom that cannot be shaken, that cannot be moved. Wow. Let us hold fast to grace. Let us, because you've received a kingdom that's beyond this world's way of doing things, let us hold fast to grace. 
whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. You see, so he is saying, hold, lay hold of grace. Why? So you can serve God. It's hard to even, difficult to serve God acceptably and worship him without grace. Do you see that? It says, wherefore we receive a kingdom which cannot be moved. Let us have grace. Let us hold fast to grace whereby we may serve God acceptably. You'll never be accepted in your own ability. Never. Never your own works. Never your own righteousness. The only way that you're going to be ever accepted is when you receive Jesus and make him the Lord of your life and choose to yield your members to him. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13, thank you, Father. Verse, thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Verse six, so we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do to me. Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, consider the end of their conversation. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. So he says he's our helper. Then he tells us to follow those through their faith and concerning the end of their conversation. What was their conversation about? What did they always talk about? What does everything hinge on? Jesus. You know, we always say, well, what would you learn? in Jesus. Jesus. So follow their faith and consider the end of their conversation. What did their conversation have to do with? That Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever? Then verse 9, be not careful with diverse or strange doctrines. Be, don't be, be not carried away by diverse and strange doctrines. For it's a good thing that the heart be established with grace. So, so it comes back to Jesus. Let your heart be established. Let your heart be fixed with grace. So just in these two scriptures, we see that with through grace that we can serve him acceptably. And we see that how that he's our helper and that that we should follow those through faith and the end of their conversation that Jesus is the same yesterday and forever and that don't be don't go after other doctrines, but your heart needs to be established with grace. Don't be, don't be moved up and down. No, be established with grace. Our lives need to be established with grace. Established with his ability. Established with his strength. Because it's in that we please him. It's in that grace that we're acceptable to him. It's in that grace that we're established in him. Thank you, Father. Let's go to James chapter 4. Let me make a statement to you that I heard yesterday as I was praying. If our heart is not established with grace, your flesh will be your decision maker. If your heart is not established in grace, your flesh will be your decision maker. Your flesh will be your leader. Thank you, Father. James chapter 4, verse 4. says, you're like unfaithful wives. Man, that's tough. (laughs) Having illicit love affairs with the world and breaking your marriage vow to God. Do you not know that being the world's friend is being God's enemy? So whoever chooses to be a friend of the world takes his stand as an enemy of God. Wow. Man, that's (laughs) that's tight when it's right. Wow. (laughs) Man. See, we're here, we, we have to submit ourselves, yield ourselves, humble ourselves, yield ourselves, but we have to be established in grace. Verse five, or do you suppose that the scripture speaking to no purpose that says the spirit whom he has caused to dwell in us yearns over us and he yearns for the spirit to be welcomed with a jealous love? Verse six, but he gives more grace. He gives more grace. Wherefore, he says, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Seek humility. Seek righteousness. And the only way to truly live in this righteousness, to operate in this grace, is going to be humility. We need him. You need him. 
We need Him. You need Jesus. You need His Word. You need everything that He sent. You need the gifts of the Spirit. You need the Holy Spirit. You need the fruit of the Spirit. You need everything that He offers. But He resists the proud. Who are the proud? The one that keep choosing to do it the old way. See, it's not proud in, 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 in our words. Proud is in our actions. I don't need God. I got a better idea. I got a better way. Only when I don't know what to do, I'll pray about it. I've done it. Well, last time I did this and it worked. Well, this time it didn't. So what do I do? You know what? I didn't yield to grace. I didn't allow grace to be established in grace. I'd allowed what happened last time. Old things have passed away. Old way of doing things need to stop in our life. And the only way it will is when we choose to humble ourselves. He resists the proud. It didn't say he doesn't love the proud. It just says he resists the proud. Meaning his hands are tied. I, I want to do something, but you know what? They, they still want to do it their way. And you know what? He'll let you do it your way. Over and over and over and over. And he's standing there all the time. Yield to me. Submit to me. Yield to me. It's not about working to earn no, it's just yielding to him. That's our only, the only th- way that, only the way that someone will be sent to hell is rejecting Jesus. And not believing that he is the sacrifice that was sufficient for their sins. But we have to humble ourselves every moment, every day, in every situation. Humble ourselves. You are the righteous of God in Christ Jesus. Be humble enough to receive it. It takes humility receiving what God says you are. Religion has taught people, no, no, there's no righteous, no, not one. Yeah, my righteousness is Philly rags, but I'm not talking about my righteousness. I'm talking about his righteousness. He gives grace to the humble. I don't know about you, but I need grace. I need grace. I need grace. I'm, I'm needing grace right now. Because some of you are looking at me, I wish he would stop talking. <laughs> grace. 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 Your heart be established, anchored, settled in grace. We've been given a kingdom that's not been shaken. So let us hold fast to grace. Because in that grace, when we're acceptable to God, man, he doesn't want us to continue in sin. Why? Because you'll never find freedom. And you can never step into the joys of what righteousness produces. He resists the proud. He gives grace to the humble. Then verse 7 says, submit yourself to God. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep and let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and what? He shall lift you up. He shall lift you up. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 5 and I'll close with this. 1 Peter chapter 5. We'll start in verse four. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, you shall receive a crown of glory that fades not away. Likewise, you younger, submit yourself unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. Clothed with humility. For God resists the proud and he gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. You know, Jesus tells us something in Matthew chapter 5. 
And he talks about the Pharisees. And he tells them this, and I believe it's 5 verse 20. He says, he goes, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the Pharisees, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. So he says, unless your righteousness exceeds the Pharisees, then you can't enter the kingdom of heaven. And I, I got that. And I was like, well, I guess I need to be better than the Pharisees. And the Lord said, you're not getting the point. It has nothing to do with being better than the Pharisees. It has to do with, with it has to be a different kind of righteousness. See, their righteousness in their own mind was based on their works and what they did. He says, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, you can't enter the kingdom of heaven. Meaning, it's not about your works. Your, your righteousness needs to be different. Your righteousness has to be different. And it has to come to the fact that when you humble, you see, the Pharisees were known for their lack of humility. They weren't humble at all. They took pride in how proud they were of how humble they thought they were and how much God really loved them. You know, I think at the time when Jesus, was, uh, Jesus tells a parable and it's right after Jesus talked about, will I find faith in the earth? And he said, there's two men that went up to pray. One was a Pharisee and one was a sinner. And he goes, the Pharisee got on his robe and went out into the streets and he, and he goes, thank God I'm not like him. <laughs> he goes, I fast twice a day and I tithe of all I have. So he's a giver. He's doing all these things. And he says, and he goes, and then he says, when there's this other man that he fell down on his knees and talked about what a wicked sinner that he was. And Jesus said, who went down justified? Who went down changed? The person that was humbling themselves under the mighty hand of God. So we humble ourselves. You, you're never going to do it in your own ability, your own strength. All he's saying is, yield to my grace so you can yield yourself to me, so you can walk in your righteousness. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, casting all the care upon him for he cares for you. Be sober, be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom may me devour. You know what? He always wants to devour grace in your life. He always wants to devour truth. He always wants to devour anything and everything that God's given you. He wants to de devour your identity and righteousness. But he says, resist steadfast in the faith, knowing the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Now get that. Who resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. If afflictions aren't sickness or disease, this is it's talking about obedience. It's talking about fulfilling the call in your life. Verse 10, but the God of all grace, who has called us into his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that you have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. Now the word suffer a while means this, to have little effect or little experience. It's not a long time. It's once you've experienced a little bit, grace kicks in. Once you've experienced a little bit, look up the word a while. It means little. And the word suffer means, means an experience. Once you've had a little bit of experience of the enemy's attack, that grace kicks in and you'll be perfect, established, strengthen, and settle you. So why do we need to walk in this grace? Why? Because it will perfect you. It will establish you. It will strengthen you and it will settle you. So Paul says, how do I live? I do what I don't want to do and the very thing I want to do, I don't do. It's not me doing, but he said, through Jesus. Because through him I have the power. What is the power? Grace. But how do we receive the grace? We humble ourselves. We need him. You need him. Every day, every moment. Jesus even said, For out, without him, I can do nothing. From this day forward, make that decision. Without him, I can do nothing. But I'm so grateful that he's given me his grace. And he's made me righteous. Father, we thank you for your word today. And we thank you for the challenge that it brings to us. Thank you that it causes us to live above this natural world. 
Father, that today we wouldn't leave here with the mindset of just continuing in the old life. But today we choose to submit, we choose to surrender, and we choose to yield to your grace that causes us to walk in your righteousness. Thank you, Father. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your goodness. We cannot live, you know, bottom line with this message this morning is we cannot live a victorious life apart from him. Mm. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father.